Hey Nate, I hooked a solar panel to the batteries of my camper and I still can't power my popcorn maker. What's wrong? That's a good question. Simply attaching a solar panel to an RV and wondering why it doesn't power all your devices is sort of like buying a Toyota Prius, adding a spoiler and expecting it to win street races. Clearing up the confusion between all the main parts and components of an electrical system like batteries, inverters, solar charge controllers, and more is exactly what we're going to cover here in episode number two of this electrical terminology playlist. My name is Nate, and welcome to the Explorers Life Mobile, Marine, and Off-Grid Electrical Academy. Before we get started, I put some important information about this academy, some additional resources, and prerequisite information related to this video down in the pinned comment below, so be sure to scroll down and check it out. Let's get started. What is a battery? A battery is the backbone of any off-grid electrical system and serves as a power storage unit. While there are more advanced aspects to understanding batteries, such as differences between 12 volt, 24 volt, and 48 volt battery banks, or the advantages of lithium batteries over traditional lead acid batteries, the key point is that batteries store power. However, having a battery without a way to use the power and to recharge it really doesn't do you any good. So moving forward, we're gonna discuss the three main methods to recharging a battery and the two ways to use the stored power, focusing on the necessary components for these processes along the way. What is a solar panel? Well, the first way to charge a battery is through solar power. A solar panel captures a fraction of the sun's energy output, which is approximately 383 septillion watts and converts it into usable power for recharging off-grid electrical systems. This process involves photons from the sun hitting the solar cells in a panel, initiating a photoelectric effect that generates voltage and wattage, but in this 101 level video, we're not gonna go any further into the science of that, but we will focus on the fundamental concept that solar panels convert solar energy into usable power. Solar panels vary in size, shape, and power output, ranging from the tiny panels used in calculators to large 500 plus watt solar panels on the roof of a house. Generally, larger panels produce more power. Now, despite the variety of different solar panel chemistries and brands, no single type or brand is significantly better. A demonstration done by Victron Energy comparing different solar panel types found only a 5% performance difference between the best and worst performers of that particular demonstration. The takeaway is that solar panels are crucial for harvesting solar energy and converting it into a usable form. So why can't you simply connect a solar panel directly to your battery? Well, that's because it will damage the battery, which leads us to the role of solar charge controllers. What is a solar charge controller? Well, solar panels, especially when wired together, often operate at a voltage that is much higher than what a battery can safely handle. For instance, a series of solar panels might produce well over 100 volts, which would be detrimental to a 12 volt battery designed for a maximum charging voltage of around 14 and a half volts. This mismatch would likely destroy the battery very quickly with the potential for rapid combustion. A solar charge controller addresses these issues by regulating the power from the solar panels and converting it to a suitable charging voltage for the battery. Solar charge controllers come in various sizes and specifications, but perform the same function, you know, differing primarily in voltage and amperage outputs. The two main types of charge controllers are MPPT and PWM. PWM controllers are a little less sophisticated, are suitable for really small arrays, and MPPT controllers, which are newer and smarter, they offer more flexibility and wiring, and have become much more affordable recently, making them our preferred choice for all of the systems that we sell in our store. So as a recap, solar panels capture and forward energy to the solar charge controller, which then regulates this energy into a voltage more appropriate for battery recharging. What is a DC to DC charger? The next way to charge a battery is through the vehicle alternator. 
When the engine in your vehicle, van, motorhome, schoolie, or RV tow vehicle is running, it spins the alternator, which produces electricity. This electricity powers things like the radio, fuel pump, and headlights. And typically alternators are designed with some extra capacity for additional devices like stereo systems, winches, extra lights, or in our context, a DC to DC charger. A DC to DC charger functions similarly to a solar charge controller, transforming the power generated by the alternator into a form suitable for charging a battery bank. Often the voltage from an alternator is too low for effectively recharging a lithium house battery bank, and the DC to DC charger boosts this voltage to ensure complete battery charging. Additionally, it regulates the amperage from the alternator to prevent overheating and potential damage to the alternator due to overuse. As a recap, the engine spins the alternator, producing electrical power, which the DC to DC charger then regulates the voltage and amperage to recharge the lithium house battery bank. What is a battery isolator? A battery isolator is a simpler, less sophisticated device for alternator charging than a DC to DC charger. It is basically a switch that connects or disconnects the alternator from the house battery bank based on voltage levels. When the engine runs, the voltage from the alternator rises, causing the isolator to connect allowing the house battery bank to charge. And when the engine stops, the alternator voltage drops, causing the isolator to disconnect and preventing the starter battery from draining while parked. Isolators, being less sophisticated, don't really regulate the amperage from the alternator, which can be sort of problematic with lithium battery banks, and they may draw excessive power, potentially overheating the alternator. Some advanced isolators like Battleborn's Li BIM cycle on and off to allow the alternator to cool, although this can just limit the charging capacity while driving. Given these complexities and potential risks, we here at Explorus Life typically recommend DC to DC chargers for alternator charging over battery isolators, favoring their programmability and consistency. What are shore power chargers? Shore power is another method to charge off-grid electrical systems commonly used in vans, motorhomes, RVs, and boats. And it involves connecting to grid power from sources like campground power pedestals or residential outlets. While connected to the grid, the system isn't technically off-grid anymore, but shore power remains a crucial recharge method for mobile applications. AC power flows from the shore power source into the system's battery charger, which then converts it into a DC voltage suitable for charging the battery bank. For example, when charging a 12 volt battery bank from a standard US household outlet, the charger converts the 120 volt AC current into the 14.6 volt DC current required for the battery. Now, if you have a different battery bank voltage or live in a different country with a different grid voltage, there are shore power charges available for pretty much all of those combinations as well. What does a generator do? While discussing shore power, it makes sense to also talk about generators. A generator is an internal combustion engine designed to create electricity. It burns fuel such as gasoline, diesel, or propane to spin an alternator that generates electrical output. In our off-grid electrical systems, generators and shore power can be thought of as electrically the same. For example, here in the USA, electrical power from a generator is typically 120 volts AC, which is then fed into the system's battery charger. This charger converts the 120 volts AC from the generator into the appropriate DC voltage needed to charge a 12 volt battery bank, exactly like what happens with shore power. So what are other ways to recharge a battery bank? The three primary methods for charging house battery banks in vans, RVs, motorhomes, and boats are solar, alternator, and shore power, often with a generator backup. However, there's some additional charging systems that are suitable for different applications. For instance, off-grid cabins might utilize wind energy via windmills or hydropower from running water sources. Now, we're not going to get into the specifics of these methods in this video. It's important to understand that both wind and hydropower involve spinning something to generate power, which then needs to be converted into a suitable voltage and amperage for charging a house battery bank. This concept mirrors the principles that we've already discussed with other charging methods. 
So moving forward, how do we use this stored power? Actually, let's take a 10 second break before we move on, blink a few times, stretch, drink some water. And I just wanted to give you a heads up that I've made a quiz that I'd love for you to take after watching this video. And write your score down in the comment section below so we can see how you did. Now let's keep moving. What is an inverter? An inverter plays a critical role in any off-grid system. It converts the DC power stored in a battery to AC power, which is necessary to run standard household appliances. For instance, in countries with 120 volt AC grids, an inverter will transform the 12 volt DC, 24 volt DC, or 48 volt DC stored in the battery bank to 120 volt AC. Similarly, in regions with 230 volt AC grid power, inverters are available to match those requirements as well. Depending on the situation, we can even provide three phase power or split phase power from an inverter, which we won't get into in this 101 level video, but there are all kinds of other options there. The main thing to know here is that the essential function of an inverter is to provide AC power for standard household devices from DC power stored in a battery bank. An inverter charger is a device that combines the capabilities of a shore power battery charger and an inverter all into one. When connected to shore power, it passes AC power directly through to the system's outlets. Any surplus AC power is then converted to DC power by the charger function to recharge the house battery. When disconnected from shore power, the inverter portion of the device takes over, powering all of the AC outlets from the DC power stored in the battery bank. We use inverter chargers in nearly all systems designed here at Explorus Life due to their streamlined functionality, combining an inverter and shore power charger and eliminating the need for an external transfer switch and extra wiring. How do we power 12 volt loads? In vehicles like vans, motorhomes, RVs, or boats, there are numerous 12 volt loads such as lights, fans, and refrigerators around the vehicle. If you have a 12 volt battery bank, no additional devices are needed to convert power for these loads. Most 12 volt appliances operate within a voltage range, so powering them directly from a 12 volt battery bank is typically not a problem. However, if your system includes 12 volt loads, but uses a 24 volt or 48 volt battery bank, a DC to DC converter is necessary. We'll discuss why you might choose a 24 or 48 volt battery bank over a 12 volt battery bank in a future video, so consider subscribing. What is a DC to DC converter? A DC to DC converter adjusts one DC voltage level to another. For example, in a system with 12 volt loads and a 24 volt or 48 volt battery bank, a DC to DC converter would be used to step down that 24 volt or 48 volts from the batteries to the 12 volts needed for the appliances. Now that we've covered power conversion, let's discuss power transmission, safety, and protection mechanisms like wires, fuses, and breakers. What are wires? Wires are strands of copper used to transmit electricity from one part of an electrical system to the other. They vary in size, flexibility, and type, with some being stranded and some being solid. The important thing here is that the size of a wire is crucial for its intended purpose. Here in the US, wire sizes are categorized by gauge, with common sizes ranging from 18 gauge wire being really the smallest we use, to 4 aught for much larger devices. In most other countries, wire sizes are typically referred to by their millimeter squared area equivalent. What is a fuse? A fuse is an overcurrent protection device that protects wires during excessive current flow. Overcurrent events can occur in various scenarios, such as a direct short, which is when a positive and negative wire touch each other, causing a lot of power to flow. Without a fuse, this could lead to a fire. However, with a fuse, its internal filament will melt, stopping the flow of power and preventing damage. A poorly designed system can also cause overcurrent issues. When a load demands more power than a wire can safely handle, it's going to cause the wire to overheat. A well-designed system will have fuses that melt before the wires can reach a dangerous temperature, stopping the flow of power and avoiding rapid combustion. 
There are many types of fuses, each with different specifications, but their fundamental purpose remains the same, to protect the electrical system from overcurrent events. What are breakers? Circuit breakers serve a similar function to fuses. They provide overcurrent protection, but they can also be manually switched on and off. This functionality makes breakers reusable and convenient for manually managing power flow and automatically protecting the system against overcurrent events. A simple example of a breaker is going to be your household breaker box. All of these breakers protect the wires and outlets throughout your entire house. What are fuse holders? A fuse holder is a component that holds a fuse. A fuse alone is not designed to function without a holder. The holder provides a secure and stable platform for the fuse's operation. A single fuse holder might be a simple device with connections for wires on each side, or it might be part of a more comprehensive distribution panel housing multiple fuse holders and a bus bar. An example of a distribution panel is the Victron Lynx distributor. It's designed for managing large DC loads like inverters, solar charge controllers, shore power battery chargers, and for powering secondary 12 volt fuse panels. What are bus bars? Bus bars are solid copper bars equipped with built-in studs for attaching wires and fuses. They come in various sizes and designs, some with integrated fuse holders. Bus bars are essential for distributing high amperage power throughout an electrical system, especially when paired with fuse holders like those found in the Victron Lynx distributor or the Blue Sea Safety Hub. What are wired terminals? Wire terminals are the pieces that are crimped onto the ends of wires that let us connect the wires to various system components. For example, a large gauge wire connecting to an inverter may require a wire lug, while a smaller gauge wire for a fuse block may need a ring terminal. There are many different types of terminals such as spade, pin, PV, and Dutch connectors, each designed to connect wires to specific components. And no, looping wire around a stud is generally not an acceptable practice unless that's specifically how the terminal is designed. What is heat shrink? Heat shrink is a tube of rubberized plastic that shrinks when heated. It's used to cover the connection points of terminals on wires, providing some extra protection and strain relief. The heat shrink used in our kits actually includes some heat activated adhesive on the inside, sealing out moisture and then just adding additional strain relief. What is a shunt? A shunt is an electrical measuring device installed on the negative wire from the battery bank to the rest of the system. It measures the power flowing in and out of the battery bank, providing some vital information on the state of charge or discharge. While it's not really mandatory for an off-grid electrical system to function, not having a shunt is sort of like driving without a fuel gauge. You can operate without it, but you're going to be missing important information. Now you should have a good idea of the basic parts and components found in an off-grid electrical system, and we're going to be referring to all of these parts in depth as this academy moves forward. So be sure to bookmark this video for future reference and come back to it when you need it for a refresher. Also, don't forget to take the quiz and let me know your score down in the comment section below. When you're installing, designing, or troubleshooting an off-grid electrical system, knowing the parts and components is just one piece of the puzzle. Up next, I'm going to teach you the basic math behind how the components influence the electricity flowing through the system and how to convert from one unit to the other. Tap up here to watch and I'll see you over there. Google myself. <laughs> <laughs> Quiz break. Sizes are categorized. Categorized. <laughs> Heat shrink is a piece of. It's a tube. It's a tube. Bye. <laughs>